All right, welcome everybody. This is Nathan Lindorf with the Rational Independent Monday live stream. Uh, quick update: Last Friday, the live stream got cut off because I had a sick kid at home and my wife was busy. So I will unfortunately need to, from time to time to duck out of live streams or cancel certain production items because I've got to juggle. Uh, you know, we're all busy. This is a sideline. And I've got to put kids first sometimes. It is what it is. So uh, hopefully it won't happen too often. Thankfully, everyone's feeling better now. Nothing that a, a weekend of rest and hydration doesn't solve. So let's try and pick up the threads of what we were talking about last Friday. A uh, quick review. We're discussing a little bit the idea of universal basic income. And the general principle being that the government wants to try and mitigate the worst effects of a lack of income by giving everyone who's a lawful citizen of the United States some measure of just because you're a citizen, here's some money. That's the broad strokes. Obviously, the devil's in the details. So we need to unpack it a little bit. Before we get into the specifics of any kind of implementation plan, I think it's important to understand the philosophical underpinnings or the reasons why proponents of UBI actually have a point. And that may seem a little odd coming from someone who bends conservative, but again, I'm trying to learn how to think critically here. And I don't think it is fruitful uh, to, in furthering political dialogue on this point to say one side is completely wrong and has, makes no valid points. The other side's completely right and only makes valid points. Life is complicated. So I want to unpack a little bit the reason why there's some underpinning issues that UBI attempts to address that we ignore at our own peril if we ignore these issues. So even if we don't ever pursue universal basic income or any similar type program, as a society, if we ignore these underpinning threats, uh, we're, we're likely going to end up paying for that neglect. So that's what we're trying to dig into today. Universal basic income is a basic flattening mechanism when it comes to social hierarchy. And I'm cribbing some of these notes from Jordan Peterson talking points. He's one of the most cogent thinkers on this sort of topic that I've ever dealt with. Um, you may like him, you may not like him. Here's what it is. He's an excellent thinker. And so I, I find many of his points to be persuasive. I don't agree with everything he says, but I like the way he thinks. So, broadly speaking, societies are organized along hierarchical lines. And there's a reason for that. A hierarchical structure is more efficient and more effective. The, I, the example that we gave uh, on Friday, just to quickly recap, Steve Jobs is a brilliant person, and he was able to improve the lives of literally millions and millions of people, arguably basically all of the human race, with the scope of impact that his company had. If you had a completely flat society with no hierarchy where everyone had equal access to resources and equal input, on the culture. Steve Jobs would probably be bagging groceries. And all of the contributions that his genius was able to bring to the human race would be lost. I'm doing this over an iPhone. This exists, this, is pos this connection is possible because of his contributions. If you make him someone who just bags groceries, because that's how you organize your society, you don't get this benefit. We are weaker and less well off without that brilliance. So hierarchical structures make sense. They improve the lives of everybody. They introduce inequality though. And if you go too far in that direction to an incredibly narrowly constrained, very tight pyramid, hierarchical structure, you have something that probably resembles 
a, a feudal monarchy. At the time of feudalism, you had kings and nobles and the like. But the trick was the king owned everything. He owned all the people. He owned all the land. He owned all the innovation and intellectual property, even if they didn't necessarily put it in those terms. All of that ownership was under one person, under the theory that there was a divine right of kings, that kings were made of sort of a different stuff, a different class of person. And so with the divine right of kings, you are able to um, morally proportion rights and ownership to a single man and put him in charge of everything and owning everything. And he came with all the privileges and he came with a bunch of risks and issues, etc. And it was honestly a pretty horrible system, but better than anarchy, you might argue. So a very narrow system looks pretty similar to an authoritarian government or monarchy or something along those lines. A completely flat system is what communism purports to be the idea of an equal outcome to everybody. That's the goal, that's the dream, is this idea of uh, an of equal outcome. Uh, the vernacular for that these days is equity. And a perfectly flat society has a problem. Well, it has, it has multiple problems, but two simple problems that we'll discuss as we're talking today. The first problem is Flat societies, flat power structures, means everybody's broke. It disincentivizes innovation. It disincentivizes ambition and hard work and sacrifice um, because you're not rewarded for it. You're going to end up equal to everybody else. If all of the students in a class are going to end up with a C as their final grade, no one's going to pull an all-nighter writing a wonderfully polished essay. No one is going to push their group to make a, an extraordinarily beautiful paper mache volcano or whatever the project is. There's no drive to excellence if there's no reward for excellence. Congratulations, you have a flat society. Everyone is equally mediocre. Everyone is equally broke. So if you want to accept that, that cost, and accept that you'll have a low living standard, more power to you. Go for it. But that leads me to the second issue, and this is the fatal flaw. Flat societies, communistic societies, societal structures, run counter to human nature. And we know that because they don't exist anywhere spontaneously created. If you stick a hundred people on, off of a boat and they crash onto a desert island, you are going to organically create a social structure that resembles a free market. You're gonna get people who are young and risk-taking and healthy, who are gonna go and hunt wild game. You're gonna get other people who maybe have dexterous hands or uh, particular skills, maybe from their prior life, that weave nets that can be used to catch fish. You're going to get someone who's a great swimmer who's going to become a fisherman or a spear, you know, spear fisherman or a, a pearl diver, whatever. People will pursue the strengths that they have in order to contribute value to what becomes a little microcosm of an economy so that they can all survive. Because on a desert island, you crash if nobody works. Nobody eats, everybody starves. If everybody works, and even more importantly, works according to their own specialties, their own strengths, where they can be relatively more efficient, then everyone can take part of the value that they create and everyone survives. You don't need an outside enforcement structure to create this little thought experiment of a desert island economy. It just happens because people have inborn needs. They need to resolve those needs. And so they do so because we want to survive. Human beings want to survive. Left to their own devices, they'll do so. Now, what if 
let's just twist it up a little bit. What if six months after these hundred people land and they have a stable burgeoning, uh, by stable, I mean a working economy, a little, little bit of a, a growing economy. They're starting to figure things out. They've, they've got their basic needs met. They're just starting to get a little bit of breathing room and some modern day pirates sweep in and you introduce weapons and force into this hypothetical. If the pirates come in and they control all the weapons, if they have all the guns and all the ammunition and all of the willingness to do violence, now you have a situation where the market is not the only voice in who gets to receive goods and services. Now you have someone who is able to take. Now let's say they are motivated by communist principles. They say, you know what? This, everyone needs to, I don't want to be a robber baron. I don't want all this stuff. I want everything to be equal. So I'm going to use force in order to make it so that everyone ends up with an equal share of the crop, an equal share of the fish, an equal share of the shelter, what have you, the goods and services the economy produces. And even if people don't want that, these beneficent pirates will force that conclusion because they have a monopoly on violence. And so people comply. That is the closest thing that we have to a communist corollary as it's been attempted over the last 130, 40 years, whatever it is, since Marx had his interesting dreams. Because communism does not arise naturally, because it runs counter to human nature, it has always been implemented by force. And once you implement those kinds of market outcomes through force, you wreck the society. You cause death on a scale previously unimagined. You cause a constraint to freedom. You hamstring the productive capacity of, the, of a regular human being. And you end up with late stage Soviet communism. You end up with Cambodia, Vietnam, North Korea. I mean, just look at a satellite map of Korea and compare South Korea to North Korea and tell me which one of these societies is prospering? Which one of these societies is more successfully creating value? So, growing up, I had kind of the naive idea of saying, oh, I know communism is bad. I'm on the right. I'm conservative. I'm against communism. So I'm going to just cancel out the idea of listening to anyone who promotes communistic principles because that's just bad. That's an absolute bad. Well, what that leaves you with is like a seesaw with all the weight on one side. It tilts you one direction. And on the spectrum between autocracy and communism, you... That's not, that's not the right way of putting it because communism is an autocratic government. So rather, let's go back to what we were describing with social hierarchies. On the spectrum between a completely flat social hierarchy, power distribution, and a completely narrow, super steep pyramid, basically like a spire, it tilts you towards the spire because you tune out the arguments for the flat. Now, here's why those arguments make sense. Here's what Jordan Peterson explained to me, as I understand it. And here's why this argument is important about UBI. Here's why there's a layer underneath it. I was digging into this a little bit. I appreciate these live streams because they're a chance to kind of tease out and refine the way I present some of my thoughts. So I appreciate your patience as I explore them. Let's take an analogy of a Monopoly game, or even better, if you've never played it, Settlers of Catan. So Settlers of Catan is a game where you build 
these little tiles and you put them together into a shape and the island is different every time. And some parts of the island are more prosperous than others. And it is a game of limited resources. So everyone is has some good things and some things they're deficient in. It's supposed to be a trading or a bartering game. But in my experience, one of the things about Settlers of Catan is that if you manage to get an early leg up in the game, there's very little in the way of mechanisms to play catch up. And so I often see that whoever gets an early leg up ends up typically winning and usually winning by a pretty good margin. And it's pretty rare for there to be a reversal. Um, and that is a corollary, silly one, but a corollary for the argument that people who are bent towards the flat social structure make when they say, everyone needs to leg up sometimes, or let's look at power or privilege. Let's look at <clears throat> your ancestors were better positioned by skin color or social caste or whatever. So you started the race ahead of everybody else. You have a leg up. And because you have a leg up, other people can't catch up to you. And I think that's an argument rooted in the idea of fairness. And it's a childish notion, but it has an emotional appeal. But I think the core of that argument rests on the idea that once you get ahead, no one can catch you. Once you get ahead, you are just off to the races and so are your children and so are your children after them and so on and so forth. Well, I'll talk about it in another video, but that's not actually how it pans out. But let's just assume for a second that they're factually correct. If they're factually correct, then what that means is those who are the have-nots, those who don't have a leg up, those who are players in the game with one sheep and one piece of ore or metal or whatever, and they don't have enough to trade with, and they don't have enough to build, and they can't accomplish any of their goals, and they're watching everyone else move ahead, and they are just stuck, in, stuck at zero. They're not invested in the game. They don't care how the game goes because they feel like they've already lost. And if you get enough players of the game who feel like they're stuck at zero and there's never any hope of catching up, then they're not motivated to play the game. They're motivated to flip the table over and say, let's start a new game or play a different game and maybe this time I'll end up on top. They're motivated towards revolution. That is a real risk. If your society likely exists somewhere between completely flat or artificially narrow, you're somewhere between those two spectrums if you look at the way your society has balanced its power. If it tilts too far towards flat, everybody's lifestyle and personal freedoms suffer. If it tilts too far towards spiky, towards narrow, then the rich get richer and the poor foment revolution. Both of those outcomes are pretty terrible. So I have softened my stance as I have grown up and paid attention to this dialogue that when someone is making an argument saying the poor can't catch up. We are not flat enough. We don't have enough opportunity. Listen to what they are, to the risks they're pointing out. Because the risk of ignoring that argument, if you ignore it for too long and society gets too pointed, you have the possibility of losing everything. You, have, you run the risk of catastrophic system failure. And like Jordan Peterson points out expertly, we don't know the tipping point. You don't know how far you can t squeeze it towards narrow before you go from efficient 
and therefore everyone prospers, to corrupt and too narrow, and you have an, a critical mass of people who are left on the outside in the cold looking in. And so those that are outside say, well, this all sucks. Let's band together and flip over the table. So I, th I think it's worth recognizing that the calls for UBI are at least partially motivated by a desire to blunt the effects of a system that is observed to be too narrow, too much of a spike. And I think while I can, I can appreciate the motivation and the sincere desire to try and craft a system that is free and fair, but I think we have to, if we're thinking critically, we have to parse between a correct diagnosis of a risk or a symptom and a correct prognosis or correct course of treatment for that risk or that symptom. Now, let me put it this way. You might have cancer. One way to fix cancer is to cut out the cancerous piece. Another way is to poison the whole body with a poison that dramatically affects rapid growing cells. So you hope that the poison kills the cancer before it kills you. That's why chemotherapy is so terrible. So, um, you trust your doctor to first identify hey, you have cancer because you have to have a correct diagnosis or you have no hope of treating that issue. Now, we not only need to diagnose it correctly, we also need to identify the correct course of treatment. Maybe it's surgery, maybe it's chemo, maybe it's a juice cleanse. I'm teasing, but uh, going back to the Steve Jobs analysis, he died of cancer and one of the reasons is he delayed doctor recommended treatment because he wanted to try and fix it with the juice cleanse. It is what it is. So I don't agree with, while I agree that their diagnosis has merit, I don't agree with their proposed solution because it doesn't make it better. If anything, it makes everything worse. General, whenever you see communistic principles implemented at large scales, it's, it's too expensive on the body politic. You're, uh, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, which is full of analogies today. Here's my suggestion for a course of treatment that I think more effectively deals with this real issue. You need to keep your society fluid. And here's what I mean by that. In the French Revolution, one of the reasons why it happened is because if you were born a peasant, you were going to be a peasant your whole life, regardless if you made smart or dumb decisions. If you were born into the aristocracy, then you were going to be in the aristocracy, regardless if you made catastrophically bad decisions or not. In other words, they had a very static social structure. There was not a lot of movement between the classes or the castes. And because of that, it strengthened the argument that if we're poor and on the outside, we always will be. But there's no hope for an alternative. The American structure has been, you eat what you kill. In many ways, you prosper based on your ability. That's a beautiful thing because it motivates people to take the risk to try and innovate. And as a society, you want a certain percentage of your people to be innovators and risk takers. Because even though it's personally catastrophic for your household to go bankrupt because your brilliant idea did not pan out, it is societally 
hundred times more useful to society if you have 10 risk takers and nine of them fail and one of them is a Steve Jobs. And that innovation of that one that succeeds has an outside benefit to all of society and that person's social standing skyrockets. I mean, I jokingly like to say that Elon Musk is the richest African American in the world because he's literally an African American. He was born in South Africa and now he's an American citizen. And yet he's the richest man in the world or close to it. So he benefited from a meteoric rise. At the same time, if society protects him from the consequences of his failures, such that if you climb the ladder and you reach a certain point, you can never fall out of favor. You can never be punished for your mistakes. Now you're ossifying your social structure. Now you're solidifying it. You're making it less flexible. And the people at the top are the new aristocracy and they stay there even if they're terrible at what they're doing. I believe in leaving someone who is a first generation immigrant to America, leaving them free to rise to the point of being the wealthiest person, not only in America, but in the world, from the sheer force of will and brilliance and cunning business maneuvering. I'm not making a moral argument about whether or not Elon Musk is a good person. I'm saying he is a stupendous business person and a valuable contributor to society. He should be free to do so. He should also be free to fail. He should be free to destroy his life by doing something stupid. And if that happens, the capital that he has accrued should leave him and rob him of the ability to make future mistakes because you can only really make mistakes at scale once you gain access to control of capital. That's literally capitalism. So if you're an idiot and you make mistakes, your capitalistic venture fails and you fall from grace. You fall out of that top caste and you no longer have that outsized influence on society and that capital, flow, capital flows from you to other people who are making smart decisions. So here's my, I see your UBI and raise you one better. Abolish too big to fail as an operating principle. Too big to fail ossifies the social structure. It keeps the behemoth capital conglomerates at the wheel controlling the direction of society and innovation. And when it does that, it robs us of our ability to innovate and it robs these people of accountability for mistakes that they might make. And you end up in a position where, you know, where it breeds corruption. It breeds class envy. It breeds wealth destruction. It magnifies risk tremendously. It causes all sorts of problems. And it stems from government's willingness to step in and protect wealth from mistakes. So consequence free, you create all sorts of other issues and problems in society. So rather than UBI, keep people in the game and away from revolution by making a very real offer at a societal level of saying that if you risk and work and sacrifice and bring all your brilliance to the table, you have a chance to succeed. You have the ability to become extraordinarily wealthy. You don't have a guarantee of it, but you have a chance. You're still in the game. You can still play catch up. The guy that's ahead of you could screw up and wipe out his wealth. And now you could leapfrog him. You could buy his assets at a discount, at a bankruptcy sale. And now you can jump ahead 
by making a smart decision if you remove too big to fail as an operating principle of government. So there you go. That's what I wanted to get to on Friday. Thank you for sticking with me. I hope this was interesting for you. Have a wonderful day. Take care.